It's adoption week and we are so excited to film this video finally and share with all of you our adoption story for our youngest son Daniel and show you his adorable little face. This is the first video that you've come across on our channel. Welcome to Faith Foster Fire Life. Our channel is all about our Christian faith, our foster care and adoption journey, and our life as a fire family. My husband is a firefighter. So, and if you're not new, welcome back. And I hope that you guys are as excited as I am to be sharing um, the adoption story for our youngest son, Daniel. And um, finally, getting to show him to all of you. We are so excited about that. So I am filming this on June 8th and his ado adoption is on June 10th. So I'm doing this a couple of days early just so I can give you the background story before the day of adoption. And then at the end of this video, I will add on um, a little slideshow of pictures of him that I haven't been able to share so far. And but I wanted to start off this video by um, just going back to the beginning. So Daniel is about two years old. He's almost two. And we've had him since he was three days old. So we got a phone call um, in June of 2019. And they asked us if we had space or room um, or the desire <laughs> to take a newborn. And at the time he was just two days old and we said yes. Now we had just um, reunified one of our previous foster children who was also a baby back with their family. And so we were only without a foster child for a couple of weeks when they gave us the, the notification or gave us the call to see if we wanted to take Daniel. And um, I'll be honest with you guys, my husband and I are in our 40s, so I was 42 at the time. But, um, so to be honest, we were getting tired, like as far as physically tired, you know, like newborn, you're up every two hours, all that kind of stuff. And so we really weren't sure if we were going to say yes right away. It wasn't something that we were like, oh, we hope we get a call for a newborn. Um, so we of course prayed about it, right? So we never want to take a child into our home before asking God if we're the right home. We always preach about um, there's not enough foster families, um, but that doesn't mean you should always say yes to every phone call that you get, right? And we've talked about that in, in some of our other videos if you've watched some of our foster care training type of videos. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that this was the right placement for us and that we could do it, you know, that we were up for the task of a newborn placement. And obviously we said yes. And so we then went to the hospital and picked up Daniel um, at three days old. And he has been with us ever since. And so a lot of times we get asked, how long are you going to have this child for? And as a foster family, you never, ever know. Um, it's You have to be open to as little or as long as the child needs. And we were not taking in a baby in the hopes of adoption. We were taking him in as a foster child and we expected to say to, goodbye to him one day. But God had a different plan. And um, like, like I said, we are in our 40s and <laughs> our oldest son is 20 years old and our next oldest is 17. And then we do have a five-year-old that we also adopted from foster care. And um, so starting all over again um, was not something we were necessarily planning on doing. But God, is his plan is always better than ours, right? It's always, always better. So we took Daniel at three days old and began our foster journey with him. And it was the typical kind of placement where he had visits with his birth parents um, weekly, an hour weekly supervised by somebody from the Department of Children, Youth and Families. And um, that went along the way it normally does. Um, they attended most of their visits and um, everything was kind of going along the way it typically does. Then around um, a year old, they asked us if we were pre-adoptive. And so sometimes they ask that just to be aware, like what families are pre-adoptive and what families are not. Um, but sometimes they're asking because they know what's coming down the pipeline and they can kind of sense where the case is going and they wanna know if 
your family is willing to adopt this child or if they should start searching for other adoptive families outside of um, foster care. And so off the bat, we said we have to think about it. And that might sound weird because how would we not know by that time um, whether or not Daniel is our son or not? And I think we did know deep down, but my husband and I, I think we're a little bit scared to say yes because again, it's that long-term commitment. A foster placement, you may have them for years, but it's not 18 years, it's not the rest of your life. And we just really, really want to make sure that this is what God had for our family. So we did, we prayed about it and it became really clear to us that Daniel um, would end up staying with us and that we should say, yes, we are pre-adoptive. So we went ahead and let the department know that we were a pre-adoptive family and we just had to sit back and wait and see where the case went. At this time, the birth parents still had all of their uh, parental rights intact, nothing was taken away. They were just still continuing to work on their reunification plan. And, um, you know, in this video and, and any future videos, I cannot and I would not share any of their personal information or even really um, details about Daniel's particulars um, for his situation because that's private and it's not my story to tell. So we will always share just from our perspective and what our family um, go, went through in the process. So he was about a year old and um, around between a year and 18 months, the state is supposed to move in one direction or the other. And by that, I mean, they're supposed to be um, steadily working to, towards reunification, which means um, maybe parents are gonna have increased visits, um, and more time with their children. They're, they're progressing well in their treatment plan and they're doing everything that the state is asking them to do. And so that you're moving closer and closer to the child reunifying and going back home. Or other things are happening where um, the treatment plan is not being followed or more information has been discovered um, as the case has moved on and the department is seeing that it's probably not in the child's best interest to reunify them with their parents. So then um, a termination of parental rights will be the next step. So like I said, we said we were pre-adoptive around a year old. So they knew that if the case went towards TPR, that Daniel would not have to go anywhere. He would be continue in the family he's already been raised in. And um, so that was good, an easy step for them. Um, and so we just had to wait and see what happened. And again, we were not given a lot of information as far as what parents were doing or not doing. The only real indicators we had was what we could see at his visits, um, whether or not they showed up consistently, um, and you know, just basically their demeanor. And I have shared in previous videos that I typically do not um, go to the visits. I definitely do not supervise the visits. That's not my role as a foster parent at all. Um, but in the past I had transported to the visits and gotten to know parents. And then sometimes when I felt like it wasn't safe, I would not transport. I would have requests that somebody from the department um, do the transportation. And that way I could keep my anonymity um, and safety a little more secure. But in this case, um, I did feel safe around Daniel's birth parents. And um, so I did say that I could transport. And this was again during the pandemic time. And we went from virtual visits back to in-person visits and resources were a little bit tight for the department. So I felt comfortable doing the transportation. So during that time, I got to know them and they got to know me and Pat a little bit. Um, and Pat is my husband, for those of you who are new. And um, he would, I think he only was able to transport twice during that time. So um, they got to know him a little bit, but mostly we, we began a little bit of a relationship and it was good. We got along very well. Um, we are both Christians and come from that background. So that was really a wonderful thing to have that common ground. And um, so, <sighs> I could go into more details, but the long story short is there came a time around a year and a half old that the department decided that the best interest of Daniel was to terminate parental rights and for him to be adopted. And so when that became clear, um, 
that's what we did. We said, yes, we will be the family. We would love to adopt him and we see him and love him as our son. And so then we had to kind of make the mental shift with um, birth parents from um, a relationship of we're caring for your child versus, um, you know, we're mom and dad. And um, I think that transition actually went pretty well because they had a good relationship with me and they knew that we shared a common um, uh, background of our Christian faith. They, I think, felt very comfortable and happy that we were the family that was going to adopt Daniel. They, they knew that no matter what, they were not going to get him back. So they knew he'd be adopted by someone. So I think it gave them a lot of comfort to know that he's going to stay with the same family that's raised him since birth. And um, there were some core values that we shared. So, um, so that made things a lot easier. And um, so from there, um, while children are still in foster care, they still have visits. So actually this week was his last visit with his birth parents. Um, and because adoption is in two days from now. You're going to see this video on adoption day. Um, I upload on Thursdays, usually at seven, and um, the adoption is happening earlier in the day. So you're gonna see this on adoption day. Um, so this is kind of real time for you guys. Um, so he had his last visit with his birth parents on Monday. And um, going forward, we did decide to do an open adoption. So um, that means we negotiated how many visits um, per year we would allow or feel comfortable with. And then some other things too, like how would we communicate um, through email uh, or phone or um, and what other things we would share. So we will be giving them some visits throughout the year. I'm not gonna specify um, how many and things like that. Um, I'm just gonna have to see how that goes and how comfortable we feel sharing specifics, but it is an open adoption. I will share that. And um, so at those visits, we will also give them updates on his schooling and his health and things like that. Um, we allow them to take pictures of him while they're on their visit. And um, one interesting thing that you guys might find um, helpful if you're thinking about fostering or adopting is that while you're fostering, you cannot share anything about your foster children on social media but the birth parents can you know so um you may see um in our instance um we have a facebook account um that we communicate through so um they have been able to share pictures of daniel on their facebook but now once adoption happens it's going to switch where we're the ones that can share about him and, and his pictures and all that and now they're not allowed to um, so they will get to take pictures, but it's for their own personal enjoyment. <laughs> so um, once yeah. parental rights are terminated, then we start our adoption process. And so in the state of Rhode Island, um, you have to get an adoption attorney, which there are um, a handful of them that commonly do adoptions from foster care in Rhode Island. So it's pretty easy to um, hire your attorney because they kind of work with the state. So we actually just used the same attorney that we used for our last adoption. We just reached out to her and let her know that we were adopting again and would she take that case? And she said yes. So we've worked with the same attorney, which is great. And um, it's a fairly simple process. As long as there's no major hiccups, really the adoption attorney is just doing the standard paperwork and the cost for doing that standard paperwork is covered by the state of Rhode Island. Um, it's a benefit of adoption from foster care. So we have not had to pay out of pocket for either one of our, our adoptions because they were both pretty straightforward. We didn't have to go back and forth with mediation or put anything really out of the ordinary in our adoption agreements. They're pretty standard. So uh, we lucked out there that um, our costs were covered. So we went ahead and got our adoption attorney. Um, she started the process with um, on her end what she needed to do. And um, that was just really simple. Some um, emails back and forth, a couple of phone calls, signing the standard paperwork. So that part was very simple. And then even though we have been foster parents for 12 years and we've had our fingerprints done tons of times, you have to go get your fingerprints done again for your adoption. So we had that scheduled and got that done pretty quickly. 
and then there's the permanency department um, calls you and well in this case calls us because pandemic right so <laughs> everything's happening either through email phone call zoom stuff like that um, so permanency gives you a call and then they go over whether or not your child is um, if they qualify for any kind of continued stipend medical coverage daycare coverage things like that so I'll share with you in the state of Rhode Island and I know that this is different throughout the country because I have watched some other um, foster and adoptive families here on YouTube that have shared this this information and they live in different states and so I know it is different so if you're out of um, Rhode Island you'd ha have to check on your state but for Rhode Island um, there are some qualifications that children have that um, allow them or don't allow them to have a continued stipend and medical coverage. Um, one thing is if a child is a minority, they will get a stipend going forward. Um, if they have uh, diagnosed medical needs, and that can be um, both physical or like a mental or emotional diagnosis. Um, and if they are part of a sibling group. So with those three um, scenarios, qualify a child for a continued stipend. And that amount of stipend um, is dependent on um, the need for the child. Medical coverage. So, so he'll keep his Medicaid, which is a federal um, health coverage. We uh, add our children to our health coverage as well, and then we keep the Medicaid as a secondary insurance just to cover anything that might come up that isn't covered by our insurance is like a, um, a safety net. So they will, they do keep both of those. And then um, daycare is also covered if you work. So, and that's an ongoing thing. You have to show your employment and um, to continue to receive that benefit of their daycare being paid for. So, um, and you know, they try, I think their best to continue to make adoption from foster care as reasonable as possible um, and you know they try to help the kids in the long run I do know that in some states children in foster care get free college uh, Rhode Island does not do that um, so you know I think they do a pretty good job of supporting the families and supporting the children going forward as best they can um, so that is the next piece of the puzzle is the permanency piece. You get that all figured out. And in our situation, that actually was a lot of work on our end for Daniel in particular, but um, we got it all worked out. And then the next thing that happens with um, your adoption is something called a full disclosure. And so this is interesting because, um, because we've had Daniel since he was three days old, we really knew everything about him. We raised him. We been the one going to the doctor and doing all the things. So um, they didn't really have to share this information with us. We already knew it. But um, at this full disclosure, it's a time where the department comes and sits with you and goes through everything they know about the child from the time the case was opened. And anything that the birth family shares with the department is also disclosed to you, um, aside from anything that would violate a HIPAA rule uh, um, would be a HIPAA violation, excuse me. Um, so at our full disclosure, that just happened last week. And so we had a stack <laughs> of paperwork um, about Daniel that we now have in our possession, which like I said, we knew most of it, but it did give us some birth family information that's super helpful for his, um, you know, going forward for his health and um, just family history about things because that's always kind of scary when you go to the doctor and they ask you all these questions and you're like, don't know, don't know, don't know. Um, so having some family history is super helpful. So you get your full disclosure and um, then it's just a matter of signing a lot of paperwork. And um, like I said, it's gonna be interesting doing this virtually. When we adopted our son, Joseph, we got to go to the courthouse and a lot of our family came and it was like just a nice, um, you know, tangible way to like mark the occasion. Um, but we won't have that. We will do it virtually. Uh, but we are having a big adoption party for him next week. And so I'm planning to film that and share that with you. So that will be our real celebration is when we have gathered with our family and friends and celebrate Daniel's adoption. 
So guys, I am so, so grateful that you guys have jumped on this channel with us. And going forward, we're going to be able to share Daniel completely. I won't have to blur his face. And um, we'll just get to share more of this adoption journey with you and share more of our foster care experience and our knowledge and hope that we can inspire and educate and just, you know, be an advocate for the foster care and adoptive community out there. So we really hope that you guys um, enjoyed hearing how this all came about. And I'm going to stick the next little slide here is going to be um, our little Daniel from the time we got him until now. So I hope you enjoy.